we're back with Product Tank Hamburg. Woo! That's amazing. It's so amazing to see you all in the room here. And it's also amazing to see a couple of people on stream, I guess, right? Yep. I guess that's the new normal. I think so. Although I hope that we will not do multiple hybrid events. Because <laughs> what we can tell, it's quite complex. <laughs> so we also have Arne with us. Hello, Arne. Hello, New York Harbor. Hello, everybody from wherever you're watching. So, Arne, we would hand over to you to give us the famous words of introduction. The yeah. stage is yours, so to say, which Happy just to means that we go away from this stage here. <laughs> All right. So, welcome, everybody. All right, everybody. So, good evening at New York Harbor in Hamburg, as well as at home at your screens, wherever you are dialing in from. Uh, I would like to welcome you to a very special edition of Product Tank Hamburg today. Um, for today's event, we are happy to uh, contribute to the 11th Global Accessibility Awareness Day activities. And uh, the purpose of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day is to get everyone talking, thinking and learning about digital access and inclusion and more and the more than 1 billion people with disabilities and impairments. So overall, there are over 170 events happening today around the globe. And with accessibility in mind, we have also decided to offer live captions for this event. So please use the QR code shown right now to access the live captions. Before we come to tonight's uh, great speakers, please allow me to briefly introduce Product Tank to you. So our Product Tank Hamburg community has been active since 2013, and we are very happy to welcome you tonight. So who are we? On one hand, there's the brilliant Anja, product lead at Adform. And then there's the charming Tobias, or Tobias, as our English friends, uh, English friends like to call him, who coaches product leaders and managers. And there's me, Anne. I'm happy to lead the product team at Facelift. And in case you're wondering why I'm participating remotely, one of my daughters caught COVID a couple of days ago, and I didn't want to put anyone in the room at risk. So luckily, we have a hybrid event, so uh, this is not an issue. In case this is your first Product Tank event, let me briefly tell you what Product Tank is. Product Tank is a meetup by product people for product people, and it was started 2010 in London, and meanwhile spans over 200 cities worldwide. And the organization behind Product Tank is Mind the Product, who in addition to the Product Tank also run conferences, they run a great blog, have a membership program and much more. And what all these activities have in common is that they aim to bring product people together to further our craft as product people. So talking about bringing product people together, uh, I also want to mention that next month on the 17th of June, we will also be hosting our annual conference, Mind the Product Engage or MTP Engage at Kampnagel Hamburg with a program of great speakers such as Christina Wodke or Martin Eriksson and some dedicated sessions around being human as a product manager, being responsible as a product manager, being user-minded as a product manager and giving direction as a product manager. And we ex expect an amazing day with uh, 600 product people, the biggest product event in Germany so far, ever, really. Um, there are still tickets available if you're interested. So end of the promotional part. Um, now, in case you're wondering how you can contribute to this lovely community, there are a couple of ways how you can get involved. And for, for instance, you can speak at a product tank event could be in Hamburg or it could be in any of the other over 200 uh, cities. So um, please check the Product Tank website and there are ways to reach out. Or if you are a, a company or if you're representing a company, you can also decide to host or sponsor a Product Tank like New Work uh, kindly does today. Or you can write for the Mind the Product blog, one of the most respected product blogs uh, out there. Or also, if you're curious for more content, you can also become a member of the Mind the Product membership program for much more content and an overall network of, of uh, passionate product peers. There's one general uh, membership program and there's one dedicated to people managing product managers. So now, before we come to today's uh, speakers, I would really, really like to thank New Work, who are not only hosting us, at the beautiful New Work Harbor building in Hamburg today, but who are also covering the costs for this event. So 
you know, to get this out to you, to get the live captions, and also, of course, to uh, you know, the, the the drinks you will find after the event in the in the lobby. All of this is supported uh, by New Work, and I would now gladly hand over um, to Jan Schwitters from New Work to um, uh, say a few words on behalf of New Work. Jan, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Andre. We have a little... Thanks for that challenge at the beginning. Welcome here in our new work harbor, our new location, our new office. So I'm welcoming all of you here physically and also virtually out there. If I'm doing something wrong, let me know. No? So again, welcome. I'm, I'm personally energized by being in the office and that is since last week, I think two days a week or so. And it really energizes me because meeting people in the real world is different than watching Zoom. And I really enjoy that. But secondly to my dear colleagues, it's this new office. And I hope you have seen a, at least a little bit of it. It's pretty nice location with a with a terrace, with a bar. Okay. Better now? Okay. Easy tricks. So, very nice location. I just wanted to explain with the bar, with the terrace, with the gym and all that. And in case, unfortunately, you do not see much today, we have an internal party today, so that is not for the audience. But in case you want to see that office, drop me a note. We are hiring, so you can see that office every day or two days a week or whatever you want. Plus, we are offering guided tours in case you are interested or we'll just have a chit chat and drink a beer. So having that said, in, in the name of Tsing, Kununu, Honeypot and all our brands, welcome and enjoy that day. And back to Anne. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much, Jan. And thank you very much again to New Work for supporting us today. So now it's time uh, to come to tonight's program. So I'm really glad that on one hand, uh, we have Sherry Bernhaber joining us from California today. Hello, Sherry. I will put you on stage in a second. And then I'm also happy that here in Hamburg, uh, we have our local speaker, Christian Orens, with us. Welcome, Christian. I'm just um, waving. And before Anja will introduce uh, Sherry, here's once more a reminder of um, the Global uh, Accessibility Awareness Day. So you can find more information at this URL, accessibility.day. And in case you missed it earlier, here again is the QR code for the live captions for those of you who would like to make use of the live captions. And with that, I would like to hand over to Anja. Stage is yours, Anja. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, for the ones that are joining us via YouTube, the live caption link is also underneath the video in the description. So maybe that's easier than dealing with the QR code. Welcome again from my side as well here in Hamburg, as well as wherever you are in the world. Please leave us a comment from where you're joining today. And I'm really happy to introduce our first speaker tonight to you. And um, yeah, lean back and be prepared, be prepared to be amazed by the fantastic uh, Sherry Bernhaber, who is a very strong voice against um, discrimination and an advocate for people with disabilities. She is an extremely knowledgeable expert when it comes to accessibility. Uh, she's not only consulting Fortune 200 companies like McDonald's or VMware, she also consults in the government and educational sector. Her comprehensive and um, yeah, multidisciplinary knowledge uh, and educational background uh, include degrees in law, in business and in computer science. But she's not only a lawyer, a software developer, uh, she's also 
an extremely professional speaker, author, and blogger. So in her blog, she um, posts weekly about latest legal cases, about her experiences from consulting, as well as her personal life. So definitely worth having a look into this week in accessibility. She also recently got an award to be the author of the year for her Medium publication uh, in the UX Collective publication. And her book, Giving a Damn About Accessibility, which is an amazing title, by the way, uh, is available for free. And you can download it as PDF or as audiobook under accessibility.uxdesign.cc. It's really a pleasure to meet someone like Sherry, who's so passionate to improve other people's life every day. And she indeed did improve the life of millions of people with disabilities, which we have billions uh, of people with disabilities worldwide. Really enjoy the talk and uh, Sherry, good to have you, welcome. And um, she will have a task for you before she starts. So Sherry, take us away. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. And I appreciate the invite to come speak with you on, you know, what to me is the most important day of the year, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So um, I have a number of talks that I can give, and I had difficulty choosing uh, between two for this audience. So I want to take a vote, and the people in the room uh, can raise their hands, and then... Um, Arna or whoever will tell me which one uh, people are more interested in. So in terms of my background, I am, as far as I know, the only person in the world who's on three of the major accessibility uh, standards organizations. Um, I'm on the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, both their Global Leadership Council and their um, their uh, certification committee. I'm also on the ITI uh, Council for, for Accessibility, and they're the people who do the, the templates for the accessibility disclosures in the US that also has an, an EU version. And then finally, I'm on the W3C committee, which is where the accessibility standards actually come from. So I have a pretty interesting perspective, I think, uh, on where accessibility is going in the future over the next, let's say, um, two to four years, because it's really hard to project technology past about three years, it starts to get very murky. So um, I've got that talk, which is the future of accessibility. Then I've also got a more practical talk, which is how to stand up an accessibility program at your organization and how to build an accessibility roadmap. So it's a bit of a cookbook, but every step I explain why it is that you have to do uh, that particular thing and why it's in the list where it's located. Um, so show of hands, who wants to hear the practical how to build an accessibility program talk? Okay, and now the other show of hands, who wants to hear the future of accessibility? Well, darn, that's about 50-50, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, okay, the future of accessibility talk I actually also gave yesterday at VMware, and we're going to be uh, putting that recording out live. So I think what I'll do, since it looks like it's split down the middle, is I'll give you the talk that uh, you don't have public access to right now, and then um, I will send the link uh, to the product tank people when uh, it's available and they can um, give it to people on the distribution list. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Everybody seems to be happy. Okay. So without further ado, how to build an accessibility roadmap. All right. So why do you need an accessibility roadmap and what goes into it? You know, I have this um, 
philosophy that any time that I have to explain something more than twice, I write it down. And so that's what's gone into my blog and that uh, somewhat has also gone into this presentation. So there are three primary reasons to care about people with disabilities. And I think this is a fairly global concept. Uh, it's not just US uh, oriented. Um, first of all, obviously people wanna be inclusive. Uh, you know, disability is a dimension of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not always uh, adopted that way, but it really should be because when you look at DEI, it's about things that you were likely born with that you can't change that can work against you because you're not part of the majority. So that's gender, that's race, that's ethnicity, and it's also disability. So if you run into organizations that don't include uh, disability in their DEI programs, they really should. Uh, secondly, it, it's a good business um, approach. So the rules are getting stricter and stricter about public sector not wanting to purchase products that people with disabilities can't use. And the public sector can be a huge component of companies' revenue streams. So nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I'm going to make this decision that means 25% of my customers can't buy my product. But that's what happens when accessibility isn't getting included in um, just, you know, business roadmaps and schedules and definitions of done and MVP. And then finally, accessibility is the law in many countries. And in fact, in Germany, which is where you're located or many of you are located right now, they have some of the strictest accessibility laws in the world um, that have been adopted that will be coming final in uh, 2025. They're strict laws now, but the laws are going to become much stricter over the next three years. So why do we start with inclusion? Well, even if you don't personally care about inclusion, it still impacts you because millennials have are trending strongly towards caring about inclusion. 80% of millennials have said, I decided not to apply for a job because I didn't think the company was inclusive enough. All right. So even if you think inclusion doesn't matter, if you want to hire millennials in your organization and millennials are currently one third of the workforce, it's really important to take a strong public stand towards inclusion. One of the things that millennials care the most about is neurodiversity because they even if they don't identify as neurodiverse, I guarantee you they know somebody who does. And so that's important to them. And that's why you should always start um, with persuading people that accessibility is important uh, with the inclusion aspect of it. Okay. It used to be that accessibility was a competitive advantage where maybe only a couple of vendors in a particular sector uh, were providing accessible products and everybody else wasn't, and that gave it um, that advantage. But we have four EU countries who've banned the public se sector from acquiring inaccessible software. That's today. And then we've got more regulations that have been locally adopted that will kick in in 2025 when the European Accessibility Act takes effect. We have two states in the United States that have very strict accessibility laws. So even if you happen to be in a country that doesn't have accessibility law, if you want to do business in Sweden, in France, in Italy, in California, uh, they are expecting you to be accessible because that's their local laws. Okay, Canada, the UK, Australia, and Israel all have accessibility laws. And while you might not see this as important. Private litigation in the United States is through the roof. There were almost 4,500 lawsuits just in the last year, in a year where the courts were closed part-time because of COVID, just over accessibility, where people with disabilities are suing uh, restaurants, hotels, uh, online businesses, because they're saying, I can't use your site because it's not accessible, therefore you're discriminating against me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about 10 steps to take, and these are kind of in, in order uh, to building a roadmap 
to having a strong accessibility uh, program and strong disability inclusion initiatives within your organization. So the first thing is you've got to start with executive support. You're going to need to spend money, okay? That's a given. Uh, and you're going to have people who want to focus on cool new features and not accessibility. Um, accessibility is a little bit like plumbing in that no, but sometimes people don't notice it until it breaks and then all of a sudden it's an emergency. Accessibility teams within organizations tend to be fairly small. You will see ratios of maybe one accessibility engineer for 500 developers or one accessibility engineer for 800 developers sometimes. You need people talking about accessibility when your accessibility team members aren't in the room. And so that's why you need both executive support and colleague support. The executives will help you get accessibility on that MVP, the minimum viable product. They'll be able to, to influence. You're not done until it's accessible and the colleagues will be helping you promote the concept of accessibility when the accessibility team isn't there. So you need to have an internal accessibility policy. In order to have people talking about accessibility when the accessibility team isn't in the room, the best people to talk about that are employees with disabilities. But if your company is buying inaccessible software, you're creating an environment where people with disabilities are going to feel discriminated against, they're not going to feel like they belong, and most importantly, they're not going to thrive. So in order to increase the number of employees with disabilities that your organization has, you need to establish an ex internal accessibility policy, and then you need to follow it. Anything that an organization buys, builds, or uses should be accessible. Now, you Obviously, sometimes you get market areas where nothing is accessible. And so an example I'll give you of that right now is like the uh, cloud-based design products uh, like Figma and Miro and Jamboard. None of those are accessible right now. Some of them are trying, some of them are not, but it's not possible to buy something that's accessible. So what you need to do is if you have employees with disabilities, who you need to have use inaccessible products, you need to set up a plan. You need to have a, a defined exceptions process that assists that person in being able to contribute equally, even though they can't use the software. Now, when you prioritize inclusion, the number of accommodations requests, and that might be a US centric term. Um, I've also heard the phrase adjustments use. Um, but they should drop substantially um, because when you buy things that are accessible, you don't need to set up these special workarounds for employees because they're inaccessible. So the first thing that you need to do, but we're actually at step number three at this point that's directly related to product accessibility, is you must build a digital inventory. So a digital inventory is a list of Every product, website, support system, uh, third party vendor, anything that you use that has to be accessible. People don't want accessible products. People want accessible experiences. And so that includes things like your customer support system and your training program and your documentation. Don't just focus narrowly on the product, focus broadly on the entire experience and then build a list and do include third party vendors because frequently what happens with products is rather than building something from scratch, they'll license it. So for example, one thing that's really common to license is a chat bot. Nobody builds their own chat bots from scratch anymore. Some chat bots are accessible, some aren't. If you're using an inaccessible chat bot, for example, or an inaccessible mapping system, because that's another thing nobody builds anymore, your product will never be accessible until that component uh, that you've licensed is accessible. Sometimes that means working with the vendor to improve their accessibility. 
Sometimes that means replacing the vendor. If the vendor says, no, sorry, we're not interested in accessibility. If it's important enough to you to make your product accessible, then you're gonna have to replace that vendor. Because as long as there's any inaccessible aspect to the experience, it's the whole thing is gonna be inaccessible. So the next step that we frequently direct people to do is to establish a training program. This is actually pretty high priority, so that's why it's high up on the list. You need to decide what level of accessibility your organization is going to adopt as its standard. Most people today are using WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, version 2.1, level AA. So there are three levels of, of accessibility. A are the deal breakers. If you're violating an A guideline, such as putting up videos without captions, you're blocking an entire group of people with disabilities from being able to participate in that aspect of your product. If you're violating a double A guideline, you're making it hard. It's not impossible, but you're making it very difficult. AAA guidelines are a little bit more aspirational. They make the product easy to use for people with disabilities. Um, as I mentioned, most people have settled at this point on AA um, because especially in the US, that's what's been adopted by the regulations. Also, WCAG 2.1 AA is specifically referenced in the EU uh, legislation, which is EN 301549. So decide on the level and then train people on what it takes to meet that level of accessibility. Again, because having people talking about accessibility when the accessibility team isn't in the room is important, it's good to set up a champions program or an advocates program so that you can have localized experts embedded in teams who can answer questions. It's especially important for global companies because if somebody in India, for example, has an accessibility question, you don't want to have, make them wait 24 hours to get the answer. If you have an accessibility champion in your Indian uh, geo population, then that person should be able to help answer the question or connect the individual to somebody on the accessibility team who can answer that question. Okay, step number five is to establish the budget and identify the vendors. So as we mentioned in step one, which was get executive support, you're going to have to spend some money in order to, to build an accessibility program. It is best if you can centralize the accessibility budget so that it's considered an overall operational expense when you start to do chargebacks to specific uh, teams, then they tend to want to shortcut the accessibility process because they're actually paying for it. So by centralizing the budget, you're, you're removing that objection. Now it is possible and very doable to do accessibility on a shoestring budget. I'm not saying you have to spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to set up an accessibility program. There's lots of stuff that's available that's free on open source. There's training that's available that's free. You can use vendors in lower cost areas. For example, if you want to hire somebody like me in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive places on the planet, it's going to cost you about $200 an hour uh, to find somebody of, of my caliber. For somebody with maybe three to five years of testing experience, it's probably going to cost you $90 or $95 an hour. Uh, you can get people with the same skill sets in um, lower cost areas such as China and India and Bulgaria for between $18 and $30 an hour. Um, so there are uh, companies that have people in those in those best cost areas trained and certified to the American and EU accessibility standards. Um, but because they're in areas where the cost of living and salaries are much lower, uh, that uh, gives you a budgetary advantage if that's something that's important to you. So um, figuring out how much money you get to spend 
and then uh, identifying the vendors that you're going to spend it on. Um, there are other low cost options are working with nonprofits that focus on people with disabilities. Um, for example, in the US, we have the Perkins School for the Blind. It's a very famous school in Massachusetts. It's where uh, Helen Keller uh, went to school. She, um, that, that school has uh, an entire audience of people who with vision loss who, um, when they get older, can transition into accessibility testing roles. It's also possible to crowdsource. There are companies like Applause and Digivanti who um, have uh, groups of people with disabilities. They will take testing projects and then people get paid per bug, right? So you're not incurring an endless hourly expense. It's more of a bug bounty way of uh, paying for your accessibility testing. And it's got a, a feedback loop because the better your code is, the fewer bugs they're going to identify and the cheaper it's going to be uh, for you. Okay, the next thing that you can do is ask people uh, if they are willing to disclose that they have a disability. It, it becomes much more uh, progressive in organizations if executives will step up and say, hey, I am colorblind, or hey, I have dyslexia. In, uh, in uh, the UK, probably the most famous instance of this is Richard Branson. He's actually started uh, a dyslexia foundation. He's talked about uh, how dyslexia has impacted his life. Um, you know, I realize that there's a lot of data sensitivity uh, in the EU to particular uh, health details. It's really important not to focus on the medical condition, but instead focus on what it is that the person needs in order to compensate for that. So for example, for somebody who's colorblind, there are now glasses available that will reverse colorblindness while the person is wearing those glasses. Um, I was actually present when our uh, chief information officer at VMware saw the color red for the first time. And I literally cried. I mean, it was, it was that powerful of an experience. Um, but having people building a psychologically safe environment where people with disabilities, especially people with hidden disabilities, are comfortable discussing them publicly is one of the ways that you can build a, a more robust accessibility program. Okay. Larger companies definitely need to have disability employee resource groups. So employee resource groups, sometimes they're called business resource groups, or sometimes they're called affinity groups, are groups of individuals plus allies that focus on a specific dimension of diversity and inclusion. So VMware has 38,000 right now employees. We have about uh, 1,100 people usually at our monthly meetings uh, where we talk about different aspects of disability, um, different uh, breakthroughs in terms of uh, the legal system or technology, um, and we push the organization to become more inclusive of people with disabilities. So at VMware, our disability employee resource group is actually responsible for the DEI or the Dis Disability Equality Index. That's a, an American-based survey that we take every year that identifies where we're doing well in the organization with respect to accessibility and where we're doing poorly and helps us uh, pick up areas that we can improve on. Now at VMware, our disability um, employee resource group includes visible and invisible disabilities, but we also include neurodiversity and mental wellness because some people consider a neurodiverse condition disabling to themselves, but other people don't. Um, and, and likewise uh, with mental health conditions. And I will just point out that um, invisible disabilities are 70% of all disabilities. So only 30% are visible, 70% are invisible. Okay, low-hanging fruit uh, is that you know you're now you're actually ready to start fixing things. Color choices, accommodations, discussions, presentation templates, and captions are all really easy things to fix. 
that have significant impact. So when you start doing your audits, what you want to do is you want to prioritize things that are high impact and low effort. And all of these things that I've listed here are definitely high impact and low effort. And, and do those first, because then you'll be able to capitalize on the wins in these easy areas to tackle some of the more difficult areas, such as getting your software to work with screen readers. Okay, you want to make your uh, company a desired destination for employees with disabilities. So uh, I'm showing a picture right now of Stephanie. Stephanie uh, worked at VMware and she uses an alternative and augmentative communications device or AAC. She's, she does not speak. She's working on a master's degree in communications right now. So uh, we had a, a an event where uh, people, engineers, the, the person sitting behind Stephanie is, is one of uh, VMware's engineers, where he came and interacted with her through the AAC device so he could then start thinking about, well, how would people use the VMware software with an AAC device? So again, this is probably the third time I've mentioned this, but getting employees with disabilities is critical because they bring their lived experience and then you just talk to them and you don't make assumptions. Then you're doing stuff with people with disabilities and not for people with disabilities. And finally, if it's not accessible, don't launch it. You need to establish release gates for your software so that it checks to see whether the accessibility reviews have been done and what the results are. And things that are not accessible or that have critical errors should not be launched uh, because then you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have to do a patch, um, which costs more money, takes more time, takes effort away from future development. Um, so it, you know, there just there has to be a line in the sand uh, that people don't cross for accessibility programs to be successful. So just to recap, and then if we've got time, we'll move to Q and A. Accessibility needs to be part of every company's mission and every employee's job. Okay, down to janitors. Okay, I've had situations where I couldn't get down a hallway in my wheelchair because somebody left a piece of furniture out that I couldn't get around. Okay, it's that important. It literally is every employee's job to look at accessibility through the lens of what their job description is and what it is that they do. You need to look at accessibility as a program and not a project. Okay, when you are quote unquote done, Things change, right? You get new versions of browsers, new operating systems, new features, and then you're going to have to go back and reassess accessibility for those. You know, Apple's going to release a new iPhone. You don't have any control over that, but you're going to have to make sure that when that new iPhone comes out, that your software continues to work correctly in using the accessibility features of the iPhone. So continuous process improvement, not that you finish, that you think of it as a project and you're done and you disband, okay? Accessibility isn't just about what an organization sells, it's about employees uh, needing to be able to fully participate because employees need accessibility just as much, if not more than customers do. Um, and use your corporate influence to let third party vendors know that accessibility is important to you when, for example, when VMware works with Slack or Atlassian or Zoom, we have, I think, 41 different vendors that we're working with right now. When they make accessibility improvements, they're not just improving it for VMware, they're improving it for everybody. And that's really huge impact and influence that you can have on the disability world that's going to improve everybody's perception of your organization as an inclusive environment. Thank you so much, Sherry. This was amazing. I look at smiling faces. Everybody's super excited. We have a couple of minutes for questions. So, I have a uh, question. Where's my beer? You guys are all having beer. Sure. I don't have a beer. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get on the plane. Get but, the but, it, but it's 10 o'clock in the morning, so it's a little bit early for beer. <laughs> 
let me start with a question uh, while the audience warms up. So um, as product owner, you're usually working with a lot of stakeholders and um, what would be your response if they say, well, um, our clients um, are not disabled or don't, uh, we, our product doesn't address people with disabilities. Right. So I have heard that before. We don't have customers with disabilities. Um, and my answer to that is, you know, to, to use an American expression, uh, horse pucky, uh, which means uh, that's not true. Uh, remember, 70% of disabilities are invisible. Four and a half percent of the population is colorblind. We know this. It's genetic. If your uh, product is tech related, your number goes up to six and a half percent because uh, colorblindness is linked uh, to being male. So, uh, you know, what are you saying? That you don't have any uh, users who are men, right? That That's just, they, they don't know, they don't have any uh, users with disabilities that they know of, right? Because they haven't asked. So um, I would say, uh, you know, do some quick user research. One of the things that we did at VMware was we tacked on at the end of our user research surveys, just a question, are, you know, are you interested in accessibility? Okay. We gave this to 1,100 uh, VMware users at our VMworld conference. 43% answered yes, that they were interested in accessibility. So I, I would say that you need to um, disabuse the, uh, the person who's saying that they don't have users with disabilities by proving to them that they do. Awesome. Great. More questions? Uh, otherwise, I, think I would people have... are not yet used to asking <laughs> questions in a physical room, but I saw ah. one hand carefully being raised. One brave person. After that. First of all, uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Very interesting. Um, my question is about the low hanging fruits that you mentioned. And maybe it's my English uh, skills, but I wanted to know regarding presentation templates. And another one you mentioned that was on the left of that, if you could explain just briefly what, what those mean. Sure. So for presentation templates, I'm talking about the default templates for your Word documents or your PowerPoint documents. A lot of times they're, they're set up with colors or fonts that are not accessible. And doing an accessibility review of those is important to do early because then people with disabilities will be more engaged and understanding more fully uh, what's in these presentations and documents. So there are some color contrast rules that are identified in the WCAG guidelines. So uh, I won't get too deep into the math, but a color on itself is considered to have a, a ratio of one. Uh, black on white is 21. Everything else is somewhere in the middle. So uh, the, the minimum requirement for contrast is three uh, for large text and four and a half for small text. So what that means is about 20% of color combinations are disallowed because the contrast isn't good enough. So an example of that would be, you know, somebody puts the teeny tiny gray uh, small print text at the bottom of a page that they're hoping people don't see, that's not gonna have sufficient contrast, so that's gonna fail. Uh, yellow on white is another combination that always fails. Sky blue on white is another combination that always fails. Uh, color on color can be a little bit tricky. Uh, and you definitely don't wanna mix red and green uh, because of the color blindness issues that we talked about before. So, so those are some of the basics of uh, color accessibility and why uh, presentation templates are so important to start early with making accessible because everybody in your company is going to use those likely. Thanks very much. There's another question of our friend Ishan. It's so great to see the community coming back together. Yeah, happy to be here and thanks uh, Shari for uh, sharing your thoughts. Actually, very recently, we were talking about color blindness, uh, accessibility in our company's uh, UX design. So it's good to hear a few ideas. Um, but 
personally i am let's say new to the topic and i am trying to get myself uh, more aware and maybe it's a stupid question but uh, if it's a digital product a software product what is uh, what are the more examples apart from color blindness that uh, can be let's say maybe you can tell some of them uh, sure so there are there are 50 guidelines in the WCAG about half of them have to do with complete vision loss um uh, not because that's the most common disability but because it's the hardest thing to do to make something that's inherently visual like a web page work for somebody who can't see so a couple of examples of things uh that uh are required for that particular group would be making sure that every time something changes on the screen an announcement is made to the screen reader user there's a an add on to html called aria a r i a and you can do that so you can uh, use aria to customize what it is that people who are blind hear uh so an example would be let's say i'm uh shopping from a grocery store and i put a bag of of cookies in into my shopping cart Well what's going to happen? Well first of all the subtotal is going to change. Second of all maybe you have a coupon uh for those cookies and and that shows up on the screen. If there's a delivery minimum for your grocery order, that delivery uh you know the the amount that you have to buy will be reduced because you've just added the cookies into the cart. So even though you've only done one action, it may trigger four or five different things on the screen. Another place where it's really common is you type in a uh, a postal code and the shipping charges come up, right? You've done one thing, but you've got multiple outcomes uh changing on the side of the screen and you need to make sure that all of those outcomes are explained to somebody who can't see the screen. Um reflow is absolutely critical anybody who designs an html page anymore that doesn't reflow need you know needs to find another job uh because without reflow magnification won't work and we have five times as many people like me who use magnification to see as we do who use screen readers So never design something without reflow as part of your definition of done um because you're guaranteed uh to violate multiple WCAG guidelines. That was pretty clear so <laughs> never do this. So it's it's good that we have some practical advice. Is are there more questions here in the room? Maybe in the chat. Oh there are. Now people people lose Now that they know I don't bite the last. Monica, how are you? What's your question? Hello, hi. Uh yeah, again, thank you very much for your talk. Uh I have a question regarding the selling of accessibility within companies and um I love to take the comparison to Google or other search engines which are like an disabled user which can't see, can't hear, so you have to explain everything. The zero part is always very highly ranked in within companies but not accessibility what are your arguments to go for this direction to say well you're optimizing for for search engines but the little part to do the rest for the accessibility is easy to do or do you say ah oh, this is tricky because um yeah for certain reasons Sure. So most companies establish security and privacy programs before they establish accessibility programs. And and it's always difficult when you're coming into something midstream and trying to change the way it's done. It's much easier if you're building something uh correctly from the beginning, but accessibility you rarely get the opportunity to build it from the beginning. You're usually retrofitting uh from the outset. So my recommendation for those types of situations is to look at accessibility as a form of regulatory compliance. You would never ever release a product that didn't comply with GDPR, right? Uh that that's a one-way ticket to getting fired. Uh you know, accessibility needs to be in that same conversation of security, privacy, accessibility because they're all controlled by laws and litigation and they all cut across the entire product. They don't belong to one specific feature. 
Thanks very much. Uh, we got another question, I think, right? Hi, uh, my question is, why is it that, that in 2022, companies are still struggling to implement uh, the, all the guidelines? I mean, it's as old as the internet. And do you think this will change in, uh, with a new law? So the biggest problem is that accessibility isn't taught in college, right? You can get a computer science degree or a design degree without ever hearing the word accessibility. If that changed, if those degrees required even just one course on inclusive coding or inclusive design, then you would have a whole cohort of people coming out knowing that this is important and bringing at least a little bit of skills uh, into the organization that they could then build on. Right now, accessibility is all self-taught. Um, you know, I think about, you know, 40 years ago uh, when I first started uh, working in computer science, it, software QA was the same. It was a mystery. You had to learn it on your own. You had to apprentice yourself to somebody who was already doing it and more expert than you. Now, today we have Six Sigma, right? We have people who can get entire degrees in, um, in quality engineering. I think accessibility today is where quality was 30 years ago. And I think the key to getting that change uh, is uh, getting it included into the college programs and boot camps as well, since, uh, you know, some education is starting to shift to a more non-traditional format. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that answered the question, yes. Great. Um, we're running a bit out of time, Sherry, but uh, let me first of all thanks you very much. Um, this was really insightful. I think everybody will take something into their uh, daily work um, tomorrow. And uh, maybe you have some final thoughts, words, wishes to our community. I would say that v, you know VMware pays me. So 20% of my time is working with other companies totally unconnected to VMware to help them on their accessibility journey. Um, I am one of the only burn havers on the planet. The other ones um, are my children. So uh, I'm not difficult to find. Uh, definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, if you have any questions about your own accessibility programs. Awesome. That, that reminds me that you didn't answer my contact request. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Oh, um, well, thank you very much, Sherry. Um, pleasure to have you. Have a great rest of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And uh, say hi to San Francisco. I will. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sherry. Thanks very much for this inspiring talk. And it's so great with these hybrid setups, although they drive complexity to hell, it's great to have speakers from the US interacting with an audience here in Hamburg. And we also got a live captioner sitting in the UK and doing an amazing job for us. It's really a person typing real time. Um, and if Arne could show the QR code again, that would be awesome, Arne because then people could see on their phones here in the room what Andrew is doing there behind the scenes, because I think that's legendary. It's really amazing to see that, how captions can be typed that fast. Uh, for those in the room, you will see them slightly delayed because um, Andrew is in sync with the YouTube stream, and that's slightly delayed. So he's even faster than what you see there. It's really amazing. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our second guest tonight. And our second guest is Christian Orens. Um, Christian was born in 1984 in the city of Wolfsburg, uh, which perhaps excuses his passion for their local soccer club. He went to school in Hanover and Marburg um, before he started studying media and communication science at the University of Hamburg, where in 2012, he successfully completed his master degree in what is this, media and communications science. And after that, he started a multifaceted career. So I have to look into the notes to make sure that I have the complete list. So Christian nowadays is 
a tech support, first level and second level, as far as I understood, for Deutsche Telekom. He's an independent journalist. He's a professional DJ. He's published a book recently. He's a photographer. He's a filmmaker. He's a radio host. And he's also an amusement park tester and a tour guide. And that in itself, I think you would agree, is a quite impressive list of activities. And it becomes even more impressive when you realize just one little detail. Christian is congenitally blind. So let's please welcome with a warm hand of applause, Mr. Christian Orens on stage here in Hamburg. So Christian, you asked for water, and there is some water here. Uh, I just have to open the bottle for you, and one for me. So it's here to your right. And you also need a microphone in order to speak. That's right, I forgot about that. Good that someone remembers. Wonderful. So, hi Christian, how are you? Um, yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Glad to be here. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, Christian. Um, I was thinking about the first question to ask you tonight, and as this is a highly tech-biased audience we have in the room, I was thinking about the one device that disrupted all our lives back in 2007, and that's the iPhone. I would want to know, how did the iPhone change your life? Um, yeah, the iPhone was the first... Uh, I say telephone, it's more than a telephone, but uh, we have to uh, say it this way. Um, the iPhone was the first telephone um, which was and which is fully accessible after buying. So if you remember uh, those old uh, Nokia telephones with Symbian um, uh, operating system, there you have to buy a very expensive software which reads out the screen your text messages and incoming calls and so on and uh, with the start of the smartphone um, you were able to um, access your phone after you bought it so yeah this is a very uh, big su success a very big change um, but <laughs> honestly i have to say I I'm not a, a, an Apple user anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. So you changed to let me guess. I guess Android. Yeah, of course. Why? Um, Throw my notes away now. So <laughs> why? <laughs> um, I disagree a little bit with the um, with the uh, politics of Apple. With this um, closed system, nothing could be um, dropped on your phone. Nothing could be send off your phone to somebody else you need itunes to synchronize everything has to be synchronized uh inside the apple system mm -hmm. and um yeah, uh, six years ago i've been saying to myself okay uh i definitely need a, a change i need a more open system so i decided to buy an android smartphone and i'm very happy about it because you would say it's at least as good in terms of accessibility? Uh, definitely it is. Um, I would say it is to 90%, while the iPhone is 99%. But um, yeah, for me, uh, it's just a telephone with a opportunity to read mails. And for me, the smartphone isn't a, a smart office like uh, for the others. I'm a little bit old school in this way. Uh, so, uh, for that, what I need it for, it's, uh, yeah, it's more than enough. And what do you need it for? Um, <clears throat> for, yeah, just um, <laughs> to, uh, to do telephone calls, to, to chat with um, the common chat apps like WhatsApp or Telegram or using Facebook, checking emails uh, on the way. Um, maybe listen to music. Yeah, that's it. One thing I tend to ask in job interviews when I'm interviewing product managers is what's your favorite app and why? Could you give me an answer? Mm. Um, podcast Addict. 
uh, it's a very good app to manage your podcasts, to uh, explore new podcasts and so on. Um, yeah, and also <laughs> uh, the calendar, <laughs> uh, which you shouldn't miss. Yeah, and... Okay, but let's dive a little bit deeper into the calendar because that is something I was asking myself when we've been in touch to prepare for tonight. Because I, I just cannot imagine how it works to use a calendar without actually seeing the calendar. Because for me, it's a highly visual tool where I need to see the full week to understand what's going on. How, how does it work for you? Um, it works in two ways. Uh, the one way, the easiest way, which you, go, which you all can use, ask your... A uh, voice assistant, which could be Siri, which could be uh, the Google Assistant or uh, Bixby or how they call ever call, and ask, "Hey, uh, what's happened tomorrow? Are there any appointments?" And uh, the assistant would say yes or no. Um, the other way is, yeah, just sort your calendar. Uh, you have the possibility to sort it uh, to to dates or to hours or whatever, and so. Also, the calendar is accessible, and you should, yeah, uh, you should. If you put something on your calendar, you should also um, uh, put reminders for your several appointments there. So you, your smartphone will definitely uh, send you a message some hours before your appointment will happen. And that made sure that you've been here one hour before the time. To no, uh, I've been here one hour before the time because I've uh, I've been um, walking around the inner city. I've um, I've recorded some new videos today, and I've got uh, enough time to be here earlier. So now, now that we braced a little bit, what's going on on the Android platform, and also what's going on on the Apple platform, uh, let's maybe start. Um, uh, start speaking about those things that annoy you the most. So w what is the worst digital experience for you? Um, the, the worst digital experience is uh, if you are on the website of Deutsche Bahn and want to buy your tickets uh, and you have um, those really old-fashioned uh, capture challenges where you have to type in some stupid words or signs or whatever and um, if you want to access them there is a possibility but you, you have to install a cookie hey well, how old-fashioned it is yeah you have to install a cookie so this site is accessible to you um, today there is no need for for graphical captures you can have a uh, small um, yeah, some small mathematic exercises or whatever, uh, mathematic challenges. Uh, two plus five is something everybody could uh, manage, Seven. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think this is one of the worst um, website experiences at the you moment. Right their app just to give them a chance. Um, yeah, but if you want to uh, book over their app, you have to do the, f uh, the same challenge. After you manage this challenge, you have the possibility to enable um, the two-factor um, authorization, authentication. Um, and after that, you never have to type in this uh, daemon captures again. But the way until you uh, <laughs> uh, are there is, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think we, we understand. I'm looking to the faces in the audience. Is there a product manager from Deutsche Bahn here? Okay, but maybe they are listening in the live stream and they now have some inspiration what to fix. Um, so Sherry just spoke about accessibility in general and uh, specifically about the upcoming European Accessibility Act she mentioned during her talk. Um, do you have any expectations that this will change, for example, the experience you have when you go to Deutsche Bahn DE? Um, no, definitely not, because we we here in Germany are not able to uh, to do uh, good laws for accessibility. This law um, is a chance for for us, but this is not uh, um, the must-have for companies to 
to change something. Uh, the the law asks company to change something, but um, yeah, it, it, I think um, uh, the, the politician do not understand what what does it mean to have an accessible life or accessible products, accessible e-commerce or whatever. It, but it reminds me a little bit of the days uh, when we all spoke about privacy the same way until two weeks before the GDPR became uh, yeah, a, a must-have um, and every company got stressed because they realized, oh, we should do something about that because now our board could go to prison when they don't take care of it. Um, so wouldn't you at least hope that this will be the same evolution for accessibility over the next recent years? Uh, it might be nice, but I see, um, if I have a look at, at other laws, for example, the uh, in Germany, it's, um, it's the AGG, the uh, anti das Gleichstellungs... Mm. Ah, wie ist das denn? Uh, Allgemeines, Allgemeines Gleichstellungsgesetz. Gesetz, yeah. AGG. Um, it helps so. you that you can participate uh, particip participate in more uh, things, but there are so many uh, possibilities for companies uh, to have their own um, exceptions, to say, no, you can't participate. And um, this is for me the, the best uh, example that we are not able to to do very good laws for um, having people with disabilities uh, participating in, their daily, uh, in our daily life. If you were in power, what would you do? Um, I would say uh, um, we should we should um, um, we should agree that people with disabilities um, can manage their life. Here in Germany, it's very often so that people that sighted people, for example, know always better what you as a blind person can do or should not do. And uh, we, should, we should stay away definitely from this way of thinking. With this way of thinking in, in the minds, we cannot uh, make good laws or good um, yeah, uh, things of politics for, for people with disabilities. Yeah, I guess you, you, you cannot build a good environment when you don't listen to the ones who are affected, right? Yeah, and this is one of our biggest problems in Germany, I think. We want to let everybody be safe and we uh, we only see the problem but not the solution. Yeah, so let, let's, let's speak about um, one solution in, in one of the bigger tech trends. Um, We've seen in e-mobility are these e-scooters we nowadays see in the city uh, all over the place. So if you were in power, would you allow these things to be parked on the sideways? Um, not on the sideways, but um, for example, we have special places for bicycles. Why we um, do not build up such special places also for the e-scooters? So, um, if we talk about um, alternative mobility, like um, more bicycle ways or whatever, um, we should also let the e-scooters only run on this bicycle ways, bicycle roads, and um, be also parked where only bicycles uh, should be parked and not somewhere else. Dedicated spots which you can easily navigate around. Right? Yes. Um, so you kindly allowed us to show some of your pictures because I said in the introduction already that you, yeah, you're not happy with just consuming the web. You're also a content creator, and one of your passions is photography. And we see a beautiful picture of Trier. I chose that because that's my hometown, <laughs> and you've you've been there on a trip and you took some pictures. Um, and also we've seen uh, my favorite portrait of yours which uh, shows you wearing that shirt that says, don't stare at me like that. I'm just a blind photographer. Um, so while I love that sense of humor in this statement, 
it also made me think about your motivation. So most of us, I guess, take pictures because we want memories, right? When we go to the most beautiful city south of Hamburg, let's say, Trier, um, then, we, then we take um, uh, pictures to later on watch them and yeah, finally remember where we've been. Um, but I guess that's not your key motivation, right? So why do you take pictures? Okay, let's get uh, let's go a little bit back in time. Um, I've been traveling around Scandinavia in 2014, and I wrote a very long travel report about my experience. And uh, I thought, okay, most of my friends are sighted, and nobody would read a travel report without any picture. It is <laughs> really it is. <laughs> um, so, and um, during my studies, um, I thought to myself, hey, what would happen if you're the man behind the camera? If you film or take a photo of, uh, of things, in your opinion, in, in your way of, of, uh, of thinking, in your way like you um, see the world, and uh, I thought, hey, okay, this travel through Scandinavia um, is one of, was one of my biggest traveling projects alone, without any companion. And uh, why uh, not trying to to make some pictures and some videos? And um, for me, is it is a kind of an art project because um, we all, when we make pictures, what 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 are we doing? At first, we are looking for the best. Uh, or the best uh, spot, yeah. The second thing, we're filtering. Um, we're looking for the best picture out of, of those 100 pictures we've made. And the third thing, one of the worst things, is we put it into the Photoshop and correct the picture. And this is a lie. It's a lie to ourselves, because if you're correcting your picture, if you're filtering, it's not the way you... Um, have seen the place where you have took uh, where you took your picture. So what I do is not only t uh, taking a picture of one um, fixed spot like uh, the dome in Cologne, for example, uh, or the Saint Michael's Church here in Hamburg, or Porta Nica in Trier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm heading around and I take pictures. Um, Let's say every every five or every ten centimeters, I'm I'm turning around because there is not only the Porta Nigra in Trier. The Porta Nigra isn't standing in the desert. There is something around, and it could be a construction building. It could be a, a lamppost. It could be a, a group of people. It could be whatever a dirty car or what. Yeah, um, if you have been there, you, you you would have seen all these things. So um, this is the way uh, I, um, let's really say I see the, uh, those places because um, I try to um, catch the atmosphere of this place. And what I do not is to uh, re do, a, do an audio recording, um, what might be more logical. Uh, I do pictures and I try to, uh, catch the atmosphere in in pictures. Um, and I also record videos, and there there is a very nice experiment because um, in the videos I'm able to announce where I am, and uh, you could find out yourself um, if all these things I mentioned are really in this video or not, or if there might be something really different or nothing or whatever. Um, as I said before, for me, uh, it doesn't matter if the pictures are perfect or not. It's a kind of an art experiment. The problem here in Germany is we have always to explain why we should do this, why we do that, um, and why we don't, why we do not do the things like the others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is the reason why I uh, uh, why I were sometimes wear this um, this shirt because uh, as I started making photos, people very often came and tried to grab the camera and say, hey, let me do this picture 
uh, for you uh, or should I do it for you? Um, they do not understand that um, I want to do that. And um, nobody, nobody should grab uh, others' cameras, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I, full, I fully agree. Um, so let's not dive deeper into why are you doing this, but I still need to ask you, you, you did a documentary uh, a couple of years ago um, about the Marksman Club in New Wurmsdorf. Um, the English title of that documentary, it's a 70-minute documentary. You can buy it online. Um, it's called A Piece of Culture That Disappears. So I would want to understand why a film about the Marxman tradition. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the story about, uh, behind this film is um, a friend of mine is playing the drums in the... Oh, how you call this... Um, Oh, um, I don't know. We, we, we say the Spielmannszug, uh, so the chapel of the Marksman Club, maybe. Yeah, and he asked... I would want to see what Andrew does with Spielmannszug. Um, and uh, he asked, he played a solo on this uh, festival, and he asked me to if I could uh, record him. Um, and he knows that... Um, I'm also recording videos, and he likes the idea. And I said, hey, um, what's going on there? Um, should we only record you playing, or sh uh, tell me more about this tradition? Because I know this tradition from the village I've been grown up. And um, yeah, he, uh, he told me a little bit about this four days. And I said, hey. Um, this tradition might be very unknown to m many people because in many villages uh, it's gone. They, you wouldn't find this anymore. So um, I got the idea, hey, um, uh, why not making a documentary about this? And uh, as I told you, you have to explain you have to to uh, explain always what you do. Um, people are saying, "Hey, for your first documentary, could you couldn't you choose some uh, better, some important, more important subjects?" Um, more important than marksman. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, say, <laughs> I say, I say, no. It's it's my first film, and so I decide what to do, and uh, not the others. Need to shut up. <laughs> oh, I, th I thought you were no. uh, still thinking about that. So, um, what did you learn from this production? It was your first documentary. Um, it was my first documentary where I made a lot of mistakes. Um, <laughs> That's a learning mindset, I guess. That's yeah, of course. Um, cultivate. Starting with don't having enough uh, batteries batteries for the microphone with me um i should have had a, a better camera with, uh, camera with me uh or even a better uh gimbal um yeah but um uh, um it was for me a, um a nice experience um and i really thought about to uh, do more stuff like this, but then came Corona, and uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you had to write a book, right? No, uh, this is not uh, because of Corona. <laughs> but it was released in 2021. Yes. Right? But you started way earlier? Um, I started writing, I've been starting write, uh, writing articles for my blog uh, in 2010, and the book is just... Uh, uh, yeah, a choice of of articles out of out of the blog. I see. So he's a blogger as well. That's uh, uh, one thing you can look up on the internet. I think Christian, you are doing way too many things. We cannot uh, discuss all of this in twenty minutes because um, you are also a DJ. I wanted to speak with you about your DJing, but maybe everybody goes online because 
you, you are bookable, right? We can book you for our next wedding party or company event or. But I do not. Uh, but I do not. Uh, I do not drive to Trier. Sorry, this is too far away. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. Not only because of the distance. So, and uh, you also do work as a tour guide here in the city of Hamburg. And I love that you mentioned earlier that you thought about how to write an article. Uh, about your travel experiences and how to make that interesting for sighted people that you had to put images into these articles. And a little bit with the same mindset, I guess, you're doing your tour uh, tours here in Hamburg where you allow sighted people to step into, at least for a couple of hours, into the situation of what it is like being blind. And um, so these people get blindfolded and you... Um, give them a guide stick and then you guide them through the city of Hamburg. Um, what did you learn from these tours? I think we all can at least have an idea of what we might learn or we try it. There's flyers outside I've seen, so if you want to try it, uh, you can go through the city of Hamburg with Christian. But what interests me is what did you learn from these tours? Um, one of Mm, one of the experiences is that you learn how to work with different people with different needs and different, um, yeah, different needs, let's say, um, uh, to, uh, it helps me to, to understand how, how to work with the customers, um, in the personal contact, dark contact, um, also helps to um yeah you, you know better your city because you if you are walking around um you have to know where you are uh, or you have to you in the last five years i've been um um i've been learning so much about this uh, nice city um, i've met a lot of interesting and nice people during the tours um yeah that's enough for me they, they uh, meeting nice people and helping them to change perspective the moment yeah and even if it's just um many people are asking hey uh what is the aim of your tours what do you want people to learn? And I say, hey, why? I... Again, you need to explain, right? Yeah, why? Why you always want people to learn something? If if it's a uh, team event yeah, with your company, and you want to have two hours of fun, and you want to do something different than to go on a on a dragon boat or to to uh, do whatever, um, it for me it's okay. Um, if people have, if people enjoying the tour. Um, it's nice if they are if they've learned something for themselves. Uh, yeah, it's nice, okay, but um, um, I want I don't want to be um, in German. We would say uh, I don't want to be with the, always there with the right finger. Uh, yeah, look at look at. The, you don't want to teach people. Yes, you don't want to preach. But you gave me my keyword for the last question, and that is. Fun. And I, I mentioned in the beginning that you are also a professional tester of amusement parks. Um, and that means that you test amusement parks for their accessibility and that you write reports about that, how well these parks work for people without visual perception. And from your reports, I learned that you seem to be a person that's not scared of anything. And that's also something uh, I think we heard in the last 20 minutes just from learning about all your activities but my question is when you go to an amusement park and i need to tell you i've been the last time i've been on a fair ride is like 15 years ago and it ended up me being a bit in the hospital because i got so sick from the break dancer um, so i totally don't understand how can you go to these things and what do you want to know about a ride before you enter it? Or do you just go there and you enter all the rides because you're not scared of it? Uh, this is one of the biggest problems uh, here in Germany. Um, most of the of the operators or the owners of the parks say, hey, you have 
you have to, uh, you need somebody with you because you need to know how the ride goes. And I say, hey, why do I need to know how the ride goes? The sighted people leave their glasses in the uh, at the entrance, so uh, in 80 meters height, they, they always uh, always do not see what happens because they are closing their eyes. And if I if I need to know about the ride. Uh, the car driver, if I uh, if I step into the taxi later on, the taxi driver wouldn't also uh, wouldn't say to me, "Okay, now we're going right, now we're going <laughs> left, now we do a break." Okay, I can. Totally this is one of the this is uh, Hamburg taxi drivers, but this is they drive slower than the roller coaster, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but the the belts in the car are not as. Um, yeah, they are not as safe as the ones in the roller coaster. Yes, of course. So um, <laughs> I do not understand why I should know about the ride. Uh, even the important th thing to know about a ride is, okay, okay, is there a looping if you don't like to have uh, loopings? Yeah, uh, or isn't there? So this is the only thing for me. And on the other hand, um, uh, I doesn't care. Is there anything that's holding you back? Um, not at the moment. Maybe I uh, <laughs> I haven't tried it before. Um, the problem is that here in Germany, um, you're, in most of the parks, you're not able to do the ride without any seeing a companion because um, uh, the Technische Überwachungsverein, TÜV, and also some uh, uh, local organizations say, hey, uh, you are not allowed to do the ride because you have to evacuate yourself in 80 meters height when the train stops. And I ask, hey, uh, how often does the the, uh, the roller coaster stop? Uh, 20 times a day or, um, or more or less or whatever. And the problem is, like I said before, we in Germany, we are loving our safety. And we want, to, we want everything to be safe, 250%. And this is the reason why we say, um, okay, you're blind. Uh, I say you need somebody beside you to help you. Okay, this, um, um, this, yeah, um, don't must be the problem because if you are standing in front of me in the queue, I could ask you, hey, would you help me? But the park would say, no, this is forbidden. You have to bring your um, a companion, which is listen, responsible for you. Nobody has to be responsible. Nobody can be responsible for you because you're an adult, you're more, uh, over 18 years old. Yeah? You're responsible for yourself and nobody else. Yeah. And this is also why I believe um, that we have a big problem with uh, true accessibility here in Germany. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful final statement. So we should all be aware that we treat you like an adult because you are an adult and we should keep your needs into account just the way we keep all the other, uh, we, we try to take all the other user needs into account and that's something we all can take with us and try to bring to life in our products, I guess, from tomorrow onwards. And let's hope that Deutsche Bahn listens and we'll fix some capture challenges uh, in their check-in routine. No, they won't because they are thinking they're, they are doing everything right. If you are if you're commenting on their Facebook page, you've got a very nice uh, um, standard phrases back and, oh, we apologize. Like in the announcements on the platform, we apologize for any inconvenience. <laughs> okay. So, Christian, thanks very much for joining us tonight. It was, it was really a pleasure having you and learning from your perspective. Um, there were so many topics we didn't cover, but uh, you can buy his book, Blind Dance, Experiences and Thoughts of a Blind Man on Amazon. Uh, you can book a tour, tour with him. There's flyers outdoors. Uh, you can find him online. Uh, the link is in the show notes. Um, and for sure, you can book him as a DJ for your next wedding party or team event or whatever. Uh, so thanks again for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for allowing us to learn from your perspective. And thanks everyone in the audience for joining us tonight, everyone in the live stream for joining us tonight. 
because that now is the official end of the live stream in just a second uh, before we here in the room get the chance to socialize and have some drinks, beer, coke, water, whatever you prefer. Uh, thanks again to both our speakers, Sherry Brian Harbour and Christian Orens. Thanks to everyone joining us. Thanks to our sponsor, New Work SE, for having us. Thanks to Johan Eric representing New Work SE here tonight. And you're also going to have a beer with us, I guess. Um, and also thanks to our captioner, Andrew, in the UK. And last but not least, thanks to my fellow co-organizers, Anja and Arne, and to Ben, who's taking care of the video tonight. Thanks, Ben. So thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Arne, you 